welcome to Inspiration and Adaptation, part of Bunnell Street Art Center's Artist Talk series. I'm Asia Freeman, Artistic Director of Bunnell Street Art Center, and I'm very happy to be joined today with three amazing artist mothers who are going to explore the question of how do artist mothers maneuver studio process and emotional well-being as primary caregivers in isolated times. Joining me are Brianna Allen, Carla Cope, and Maisha callahan free Welcome. Thank you. Super happy to have you with us today. I'm coming to you live from Denina and Supiak land on a beautiful piece of land by Ketchumak Bay called Kachikmak by the Supiak people, land on which Benel Street Art Center stands. It's our privilege to be doing the work of accountability, dialogue, transparency, and acknowledging the complicated history and the many stories that are the truth of this place. So turning to our dialogue today, let me introduce briefly our um, participants. And then we'll move around and look at some questions and share some images. Brianna lives in Homer with her husband, Rob, and her two daughters, Josephine at three and a half years and Manon at 17 months. She received her bachelor's in studio art and entrepreneurial studies and her bachelor's in fine arts with a concentration in painting from the University of Southern Maine in 2007. Carla Cope is a multidisciplinary artist exploring her perspective as a neurodivergent woman artist mother. Can't wait to talk to you more about that. She works primarily in painting, sculpture, and wearables. Carla first began drawing people at the age of two, and she's single-mindedly pursued art ever since. She's the mother of two daughters, married to her husband, Dan, living here in Homer for many years, and she has a BFA from Oregon College of Art and Craft in 2003. She has served on Bunnell's board of directors since 2011. Maisha callahan Freet lives in Chugiak with her husband Christian and her son Vassar. She produces photographs, abstract paintings, and mixed media sculptures utilizing found objects. Her recent performative video work is a family collaboration that explores the roles and meaning of family. Maisha holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts in Photography and Digital Media with a minor in Art History from the University of Houston. She, been a, she joined Bunnell's Board of Directors in 2019. So I'd like to begin this dialogue today um, with a question. How does being a mother today reflect in your art? Any one of you could join us in speaking up about that. And if, if it's a little bit too intense and too early to hand that strong question out, we can come back to it. Anybody feel ready to jump in on that? I don't mind starting. Okay. I think it's a, a good segue because I was going to say I feel like I'm at an intense part of parenting. Um, Vassar is 14, so that's lots of emotions, hormones. He's starting high school. So the work that I produce is centered around the evolution of our family. And I feel like we are in a huge shift right now together and just learning how to love each other. I've never parented a 14 year old before. So I'm learning how to parent a 14 year old who's transitioning to be a man. So that reflects in the art and just learning how we want to continue forward as a unit. Mm. Powerful. Your thoughts, Carla? Yeah, I um, I love that that your artwork is it is about the partnership. And I I have found that I would not be able to do any of this work without partnerships. Whether that's my my husband who believes in me and um, helps support what I do, as I you know help support his goals and desires. Um, and also being able to talk to other moms and 
specifically you three have been really wonderful um, in that in that realm. I found that as I pursue this line of artist mother inquiry, it really becomes about the the connections between artists and and mothers that. Um, the idea of an individual artist working alone in the studio is just not enough for me as a mom and as an artist. And it's the, it's the conversations that we have, the, um, the shared experience that really helps with finding the commonality and the, and the humanity in the fact that being a mother can be very isolating and lonely um, and confusing. And I find that we, almost every mom I talk to, whether they're an artist or not, has these feelings of guilt and self-doubt. And by sharing with each other, uh, we can address those and, and find that we are all doing the same thing alone. <laughs> and creating those networks has been the most transformative part of of the last two years by far. Um, I found that before I had kids, I felt like I was lacking something in, as an artist, I was trying to strive for something, but I wasn't sure what that was. And it was very much about me as an individual. Am I good enough? Am, um, you know, what am I making? Why am I making it? And now I find that it is, what are we making? How are we moving forward together? Much more compelling. Um, so it's less, I feel less competitive as an artist now. I feel more a part of a collective. And, and the same can be true about motherhood in its best <laughs> moments. Um, I find that before we had kids, I, I remember saying kind of glibly, one of the reasons I want to have kids is that, so I can make friends. <laughs> I mean, to have that, that, that immediate connection with somebody and that immediate sense of understanding and um, shared experience is really powerful. So I, I love this dovetailing of motherhood and art together. And I'm really excited by the work that, that these artists have been doing and, and that I get to be a part of, a little bit a part of their experience. Excited yeah, to look and at. I, I really respond to what you both just said. Um, um, Maisha, you said your art making is centered around the evolution of your of our family is what you said. And I was like, geez, like that. I mean, what it, it just seems like like that sort of is such an ultimate like maternal. Um, um, it is a privilege to take something like that on. But geez, talk about like carrying the world on our shoulders just that's just what we're doing, you know, our, our own big, small world. And, and you also said, you know, you, you've never parented a 14 year old before. And that, that struck me the other day for myself. It's like, you're in a constant learning curve of doing this brand new thing every day. Cause we've never parented a three and a half year old or what have you. Um, but we are in, we are forced to be in such a moment of um, present presentness and, that really doesn't afford a lot of luxury like it did bef before kids. Um, but what I find that it's left me with are the kernels, both good and bad, right? And they're kind of rough around the edges. And as I've always kind of framed art making, good art making exists in the edges, in the boundaries. And that I just feel like I'm constantly like in that space um it's kind of funny that the wall behind me it's like i feel like boxed in um and then carla and like this this connection and the sharing is really where my brain has gone in my second pregnancy and child you know there was a moment actually my first that it was like a weird moment that i had a friend um come to me and sort of like confess like this funny story about her child and it was that moment where I was like why does this feel like such like a an authentic random connection that I just made with her and it was just that it was like that 
feeling of confession and um, you can instantly relate to this other mom and, and this also sense of release in mm -hmm. yourself. And oh my gosh, I mean, that's, it's like, thank goodness for it, but it doesn't exist on its own without it being massaged or practiced or accepted or what have you. So my, my artwork um, has shifted at the moment from painting. I'm doing a little bit of drawing in this subject matter, but it's primarily been focused on sharing my own stories and other stories um, on a wider, more anonymous um, platform. Um, and I have found so much deep connection among these stories that are short and long and funny and sad and hard. And, um, and that has really re like released so much inside of me as an artist, as a mom, as a person, as a friend. And, and it feels like all of the boats are rising at the same time. And so right now, I guess that's where my artwork has been in my practice is this, um, the storytelling that I'm, I just want moms to feel elevated to have these stories, to share these stories and to just um, give them the respect that they deserve because it's a tough job um, and um, it feels really nice to know that you all are doing it too. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited to um, see how these ideas that you all have shared about mothering and making um, surface in your work. Could we look at some images? Maybe we could start with Maisha if you're comfortable, um, just sharing through screen share um, a little bit of uh, background perhaps and then what you're making today. So. So will you let me know when that is? Yeah, we see your images and maybe you could just give okay. us a little context. So this For is a project that, so I work in tandem with my husband, Christian Free, um, and we have been working on a project that we entitled We Means Three, because it's the three of us. Um, and it's just, intimate look into an intimate look into moments of our lives um, and so it, it's just started with tiny moments and now has evolved into um, I think a more refined look into what I want the direction that I want the art and the project to um, go. Um, I think that during the early part of the project, we were doing a lot of healing as a family and, and we, you know, made a transition moving from Texas, um, and just learning about each other, learning about Vassar, um, and, and learning where we wanted to be once we removed ourselves from everything that was familiar to us. Um, so these are the beginning stages, which is very, uh, we're into just documenting our lives. So now I will share a video. This video is entitled, Pick Me Up. Um, So I'll let it play for just a bit. And specifically, Pick Me Up is, is just about family support and how we are the first line of defense for each other. And, and sometimes it's messy and it's hard and you know it might be easier for someone in in one situation but we try and that is the ultimate goal is to be there for each other and to figure it out 
I really respond to the black and white quality of the video, just sort of like that, that stark and pure aspect. And it's, it's a silent piece, right? Yes. Mm, beautiful. I love that you're, you're, it's such a whole picture. You're including this um, humor element and absurdity, but then it, it, it's deeply, I feel it physically in my body and it, um, it's very emotional and um, affecting on a, on, on a lot of different levels. It strikes me that, you know, mothering and the challenges of living in, a, in the context of family um, are so much harder than the privilege of working as an independent artist. Um, it gives you, it gives so much more gravitas to the making and the act of making. Mm -hmm. This metaphor of managing the weight of each other is very powerful. How did you, you mentioned earlier that you went, you started art school when your son was only three years old. Yes. Tell I, us how you manage that. <laughs> my family is amazing. <laughs> Hmm. And I mean, that's the only way it was possible is because I have a, a supportive family that believed in me, uh, my, my parents really. Um, I just, early on in life, I just didn't think that art was really a career, but I just remember sitting in the office, looking out the window when it was beautiful. And I said, I don't want to work at a desk all day. And I just quit and applied and life started happening mm. slowly. But I, I mean, it's just, I, I was sharing with Carla the other day that I really had to start being gentle with myself in my art practice because for a long time, I thought I was supposed to be somewhere I was not. And now I think it's helped me to be able to just produce because it's, I'm producing and my family is able to do this together and to make meaningful work. And if only one person, you know, is, is moved by it, then I've done my job mm -hmm. as an artist and, and it, as it's helping our family grow. And so So you're switching, yeah. while you're switching to the other video, I'm thinking about this point you're making that it's sort of a different, deeper purpose in art making. Carla spoke to that as well about making connections. And certainly you did too, Brianna, the value of making art to build connection between yourselves and other people. So this video is entitled Through Hoops and it's just, you know, a, a commentary on the feeling of the hoops that we feel that we jump through and what that might look like, feel like. I often think of, you know, all of the things that used to be so simple, for instance, scrambled eggs, how that used to be like, like five steps, right? And <laughs> it's like 75 steps with small mm -hmm. children. So th this is, um, I, I relate to this a lot. <laughs> Vassar and Christian are passing the hoop back and forth as you jump through, which so much speaks to the way that others in our lives kind of become arbiters of our, <laughs> the space oh, in which we're moving. Absolutely. And and I, I, I really tell them all the time, I appreciate that they are willing to do this kind of work with me even if you know it, it might not speak to them like maybe they don't think that I jump through hoops for them or maybe that makes them feel a little guilty and even it makes me feel guilty to be like hey I have this idea I'm not trying to hurt your feelings but can we do this and they are so just like absolutely yes let's do this together which helps us as a unit to just stay on the same page because if we're not in a loving space, then there's no way that this work could be produced. So it just opens dialogues and 
I mean, I just love it. Thanks for sharing that powerful work. Um, Carla, could I ask you to go next and, and share sure. some? Sure. All right. Um, we, of course, are going to do that through. Are you just going to screen share for me? I had right. last minute as mothering happening before we got on here. So <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a lot about priorities that uh, sometimes you don't have a choice or control over. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I included um, I included two different projects that I've been working on. Um, one is the other shoe, which is a, a more painting um, experimentation show that's coming up in at the International Gallery of Contemporary Art in Anchorage in May of next year, 2022. Um, and these are uh, paintings about motherhood. And then um, the Soft Spot Armory is is another ongoing project that's about creating um, wearable pieces that protect uh, our bodies. And oh, thinking about that soft spot, like the, the things that, that we love and wanna protect, um, the things that make us tender and good, but also can, we can, you know, they can be hurt. Um, so thinking about how to, how to be a parent and a woman and an artist and a mother in the world um, so this one is uh, a, a more recent piece, and it is a, a, a wearable wishbone that is covered with my um, my old mom jeans that that didn't fit anymore, um, and it's all sewn and stitched to this armature that has a has a, a firmness and a little squishiness to it, and it it feels like your mom's legs when you're a little kid and you're finding protection in, you know, in her, in her physical presence. Um, and so I wanted to make one that, that was big enough for me to wear. Um, and it has like, it has a softness and the, uh, it's sewn with um, wire thread. And as I get more and more gray, I, I liked that it was like these little wild hairs that are coming out um, of this very silly and hopefully elegant wishbone form. You can go to the next one, unless people have questions. <laughs> I, I do because that one is so, I don't think it's silly at all. And I just, it is, I mean, you compared it to hanging on your mom's, through your mom's legs. And I remember that and I remember Vassar doing that. And so I just, I just love it. And the, the wild, strings or thread, excuse me. Thank you. I, um, it took me a while to figure out what the skin of it needed to be. I was trying to make these surfaces that were going to look bone-like and the, the legs, there's the actually, as I fit it together, there's actually the, you know, the crotch of the jeans fits right up into the crotch of the, of the wishbone. Um, and the wishbone is this, is a very, special symbol for a lot of families, but for, for my family growing up, we always kept the wishbone and saved it and, you know, did, pulled it apart and did the wish. And later on, I realized that there's a trick to the wishbone and who's going to win. So I felt like it was um, a little bit of a trick that's, that's played that the kid grabs it and pulls, and then they get the shorter stick. And the parent, well, at least in, in my experience, if you just hold it and don't pull, you have less resistance than you actually end up winning. Um, so the wishbone kind of holds some of that, that imagery and family history for me. But I like them as this intact structure that they are holding the potential for a charm, for a wish, for um, a hoped for outcome. And so these ones are, um, The original wishbones that I was making, and I'm and I'm just using them as ways to relate to the body and to create that protective form over our heart, um, mimicking the the uh, rib cage. Um, and then the image on the right, I've been just experimenting with surfaces, and and I'll layer paint and then sand it all down. And because because it's this imperfect kind of medium, I end up 
building this patina of, of age and, and actually these really beautiful little cracks have, have been poking through. And so I, I started highlighting those cracks. I think about that outer one, the, the, the largest wishbone in this, on that right-hand image as this kind of generational knowledge that's passed down and that it is cracked and worn, but it's, it's being kept and saved for something for, for a, you know, hope for the future that um, instead of using these wishes, we might hoard them a little bit, or I, I might hoard them a little bit. Uh, there's certainly an element of, of, um, of darkness in my work. I, I, like, I like the humor, I like the absurdity, uh, but I also wanna look at what it really is like to be a mother and a human with open eyes about all sides of the, of the um, experience. And, and I think that um, this is, so this is work that I'm actively pursuing and, and kind of throwing out all these different ideas and following these threads and seeing where I can go with it. At this stage in my, in my making, I, I feel like this giant burst of inspiration has happened within the past couple of years since um, my daughter's, so I have an eight-year-old and a uh, five-year-old. So when my littlest one turned three, about three years ago, we had a lot of life changes happen in our lives. And I, I was just turning 39 and I realized this is it. I, I'm, I don't want to feel, I don't want to look back and feel like I wasted time. I, I have to focus on, on me as a human and as an artist to be able to mother and parent and support my family in the best way possible. Um, as I felt like I was failing at, at the, 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 the things that, that seem easy for other parents. Um, so I started looking back at images of, of uh, what it looked like to be in that. So this is a, this is a painting of my first daughter and we're in Mexico and looking at um, the female form as um, from, from my perspective, but you know, feeling loving and sexy and mothering um, all at once. And, and this really private moment. And then and I just was, teaching myself how to work with oils. I've always worked with acrylics and I felt really intimidated by oils. So when I had this big um, kind of revelatory year, I realized, oh, I need to, I have to learn how to paint with oils because I'm afraid of it. And, and there was something that um, Brianna and Maisha were saying about, about the, there's this bravery aspect that I feel like once I've become a mother, I, I have to do all these things that I, that I would probably avoid. And through doing that, I realize how much stronger I am than I ever realized. And I, and I take that to my art practice and it, it feeds and informs um, everything I do in my best moments. <laughs> this is a painting that I did of my um, second daughter, and it was from a photograph that my then three-year-old took of me nursing my second daughter, which I love that, that, that those layers of imagery, imagery um, or, or layers of perspective kind of compounded in one photograph. And then as I was painting it, I, I, I was not feeling, the face wasn't right. And I let this little painting kind of sit aside for a while. And then Mother's Day hit this year, and I decided I knew just what I had to do and I had to burn a hole through this painting. I did a little film of it, um, I think it's on my Instagram. And it, almost these cloud-like shapes of kind of emerged from this burned portrait and then putting it up to my face and my, myself now looking back and looking through this, this image of a, of a nurturer and also um, mothering just becomes a lot more complicated and self-image becomes a lot more complicated with, with all of these different perspectives and, and uh, responsibilities. So that's what, that's what this piece is about, about for me. Um, this one is uh, again, a, a painting in oil and 
I used a photograph that my brother-in-law, he's an amazing photographer, artist. He took this photograph and then I, I translated it as a painting, um, but it is of my sister, my mother, my uncle, and my nephew. And it really spoke to me this, this uh, pushing down feeling, um, this kid that's leaning into grandma. And I, I called it black hole. Um, because I, I don't know if there's a tension between being pushed in and being supported. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I gotta say that there's this juicy, rich, you know, Brie, you were talking about it on the, on the margins of things. It, it's this messy kind of ambiguous space that I feel really grateful for as an artist, because it is, um, I, I like, I like that there's a question there, that there's mystery, that there's no clear answer. Sometimes that's really frustrating, but it's very freeing to, to have that space and, and to have this way of talking about it. Um, yeah. And you guys can interrupt me too if you have questions. <laughs> um, so I have two girls and I think about their relationship and our family. Um, and I find myself photographing them a lot, finding them in these, these positions where they are relating to each other. It talks about their relationship to each other and to, to me as the observer of their lives. Hmm. This is a, uh, I call this piece Mothering One. This is again using layered imagery into one painting. Um, I found these photographs of a, uh, a sea lion that was being butchered. Um, and there are, there's two photographs, it's in a book, and I photographed them from the book, and then I, I was painting these beautiful um, and grotesque kind of innards. And as I'm working on this, it, it feels very cathartic for the way that my births went down where um, with my first daughter, she was uh, overdue and very large and ended up in an emergency C-section. And the experience of suddenly, I mean, there's so much anxiety and anticipation wrapped up in waiting for the birth of this child. Meet a, a C-section happened really quickly. And I ended up getting a bacterial infection after that and dealt with um, some really awful um, symptoms for the first uh, six months of my daughter's life. So in some ways I was in this blissful space. I, I so wanted this child. And then I also was very physically compromised. Um, so super intense painting, very cathartic, but it is like that, that ripping open. And uh, I think this is an older version, but I, I'm starting to put in little figures in the background that are kind of peeking through the mess. So this one, I had to answer mothering one. This is mothering two with my second daughter. And this is actually the second layer of that sea lion that, 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 that got some inside were taken out. And these are the, the parts that are left, you know, that next layer of the inside of this animal. Um, and I find that parenting and mothering two children is so very different than one, that from my experience of one, um, and I, I feel much more divided for my second child. And there's a lot of guilt that comes along with it. And also a lot more trust that she is an individual and will, um, will grow and learn in the best way that, that she can. There's this, there's this kind of a letting go that happens, I think. Um, but using my, my body and her body as um, almost like a ghost-like kind of, I'm, I'm molding to her to this or trying to conform to this uh, experience and then she I, I, she's either hiding or she's um, like comforted under blankets under this whole big mess or maybe she's being kind of crushed by it I'm not sure <laughs> um, yeah yeah this is all very fresh and experimental work that like I said I've, I've been going through I'm spinning out in different ways and seeing what what kind of erupts from it. Um, 
I've always admired your capacity to be able to work in multiple fronts, you know, sculpturally and in painting, in different themes in painting, in different themes in sculpture as a way of finding, like doing the research, doing the work of research to figure out where the vein of gold is for you. And I found, thank you, I find that I, I can't do just one thing. I have certainly tried that, but as soon as, as soon as I have to do something, then I start getting these crazy, awesome ideas in another direction. And I've learned to juggle that and, and honor those different directions because it's actually part of the process that allows me to clear space and focus on the things that I might need do that I need to do. Um, and I, it sometimes can be a little maddening, but it mostly is really exciting and fun to, because, because the more, the, the farther I walk down a path, the more opportunities I see uh, with, with potential ideas. And yeah, it's, it's fun. Does, is being, does being a mother help you with that practice of accepting your own process just as you're learning? 100%. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, ha because time and space is so limited it becomes that much more precious to, to spend time doing that. And I have had to fight my own expectations and how, you know, other people might view the way that I choose to spend my time. I've had to fight to make that space and to make my, this work a priority. Um, and I, I'll find that I will go to the studio and I'll start tinkering with something and I'll, I'll bounce around to all these different projects I'll get hyper-focused and my kids can come in and out and be, be a part of that and also be doing their own thing simultaneously. It's when I'm trying to get them to do something that things get more challenging. But, but we do have this really beautiful flow where I might be ignoring them to a certain extent, but I also feel like I'm giving them space to be creative and do their own thing. Um, without them, Without, without being a mother, I, I almost feel like I need that, that tension to keep pushing me forward. Um, before that, I didn't feel the urge and the push as severely as I do now. I think we just lost Asia. Oh dear. Um, she'll probably pop back on, but Carol, I just wanted to respond to um, how, you know, the fact that you're pushing through your process making right now and you're making this work is such a special time of vulnerability that I think we end up forgetting about. Um, for instance, um, I just did a trip to Maine and family in Maine were asking, how, how are the girls on the airplane? I was like, oh, well, there was just, there was just like 30 minutes where they were just both freaking out. And my mom flew with me and she was like, um, it was more like three hours of them both freaking out. And, but there's like a moment, like our, we get like warped our perspective when we're in the moment. So I really truly commend you for staying so juicy and committed to your paint painting. And I know I'm so glad that that still feels like a good mode of communication for you because I just don't know if, if those inspirations will be there for you in five years, you know? Mm. Like I'm just sort of like yeah. trying to grapple with the fact that memory is, is not a constant thing. It's not a static thing, but it's actually always continuously moving and changing. And um, so it's, it's like the most personal snapshot of your, your feelings and your way of relating to your world and your, your family right now. And, and you making these paintings are very much a way for me personally to also we lose you. Well, I think she froze. Hmm. Well, I sure hope that we get her back um, because we want to see her work next. Yeah. It's um, always my issue, what, what Brie was saying reminds me of, of something that you pointed out 
for me that that it feels um oh hi Bri. i was just saying that that what you were just saying reminds me of what um my, Maisha pointed out because you have a 14 year old i have hi. an eight and five year old and Bree's really you have toddler and baby and and that you do forget what that experience is like as as we um yeah, as, our, as we adapt with our kids getting older and changing, there is a certain amount of forgetfulness mm-hmm. that happens. Bree, will you share with us some images of your work? Okay, you're muted, so there could help. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, so I thought that I would start off, I, I um, I started uh, collecting anonymous stories from mothers um, and sharing them on my social media, um, just as a way to build a um, a community of of storytelling. And so I thought I've created a website, but I thought maybe I would just start off with reading two monologues, and then I would just share the website. Um, and I'm just going to read them first, and then. I'll- Um, after. Okay, so this first one. um, I hate to tell you this girl, but we're made for this shit. That's what my sister-in-law told me. Three months post baby, I was feeling depleted physically, emotionally, spiritually. I felt like a warm moving corpse with only space between my ears and very sore nipples. I couldn't even escape to Netflix without feeling handicapped because I couldn't follow any plot unless I was both hearing English and reading English via the closed captions. Even then, I still had to rewatch all the time. Hearing that we're made for this was both affirming and totally devastating. It's a complicated feeling when you both feel inept as a human in the world and also like a ruthless maternal machine capable of doing anything it takes for as long as it takes to keep her baby sleeping. I had to bounce. I had to bounce for hours on my yoga ball. It was my baby's cure-all and my nemesis. It was our drug. I guess I was made for it because I just kept bouncing. All morning, all afternoon, all evening, bounce, bounce, bounce. My husband couldn't bounce for longer than a few minutes, he said, because it wasn't comfortable for his back, he told me. And it wasn't until then that I realized that he hadn't automatically sacrificed his own comfort the moment she was born, like I did. Wow. Um, And the second one, um, my dad's Alzheimer's was ramping up when I was pregnant with my daughter. When I went into labor, he insisted on being there, even though everyone in the room said that maybe it wasn't a good idea. He walked me around the maternity ward in endless loop like a champ. He also got a full front stage view of me having a catheter put in. He started demanding I get an epidural because he had heard me beg for one. When it was all over and and he had seen the whole thing, I apologized and he said, well, I've seen worse. We both laughed and I cried a little bit. He was the first person to hold my daughter when she was born as I was in recovery for the C-section. I will never forget those moments. I was lucky to have them. That's sweet. Made me cry. (laughs) They will sometimes. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to slip into screen share now. Um, So this is can you see it okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and you could do full screen view. There you go. Great. Um, so I've received about 50 of these stories and and the, the best part about them is that they aren't written by writers really. And it, it, they're so, they feel so fresh and authentic and just firsthand account. Um, it feels like journal entries. Um, and, and I've also begun working with um, 
a with Pier One Theater um, and also an, another writer in town in hopes to bringing this project um, a bit wider. So I found that when I was pregnant, I was getting a slew of wonderful stories. But it, and 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 so there's something to think about in in that, you know, um, because I'm not pregnant anymore, and it seems like the stories have have quieted a bit. Um, yeah. But I know that they're still out there because I'm still hearing them and I'm, you know, so um, I'm excited and hopeful that maybe it's time for this project to take on um, just a new method of getting out there and hopes in hopes of growing it. So what it, it's, it's sort of a collection of all of these stories and folks are welcome to just poke through. It's called Mamalog Collective and I'll, I'll share that in the chat. And um, you can also sort of look through um, and pick your favorite subject um, from poop to cervixes to, you know, um, midwives. And also there's a, there's a feature um, that I hope to expand upon and that's actually having the audio file for each of these stories. Um, and so I've just working with um, hopefully Pier One in the future and maybe bringing this more to the stage um, and also finding new ways to share the stories that have already been contributed for instance, having them read by other people, um, or maybe there's like a um, an overlap of performance um, that I'm just really excited to think about. Um, and I'm just gonna step out um, here and go back to our, and I'll pop that in the chat. But um, that's sort of, I've, I've just really felt um, connected and grateful for the moms who have contributed to this collective. And I'd love to do um, maybe a printed version eventually um, because they do feel so personal. And, you know, I've read that, I've read both of those stories probably 30 times and they still just find a place in me and, um, they just feel very familiar and they sit for a while and they they pull in really tender places because I ultimately know what a gift they each are, um, how personal they are and how brave women are for contributing them, especially especially when they're not the, the more of the poetic rosy versions that are more easily shared and what we usually share before we have children or what have you, but it's actually um, the, the ways that motherhood have surprised us, the ways that um, you feel like you come up short because you're not the only one. And, but in reality, we're like raising a person. Um, and, and, and I know I'm being really presumptuous and I'm just, I, my situation is my husband is gone for about half the year. So it really does take on that um, predominant role of me sort of steering. I, I say, you stay in your wheelhouse, I'll stay in mine. Um, and it works out good for half the year. And, um, but it's, it's, it is a challenge and you're often, um, like Carla said, surrounded with doubt um, and tired. You know, the, the physicality of it is, is wild. Um, and I also am really interested to hear um, thoughts about where, you know, these stories of our children, you know, where, where their autonomy is and at what point is it our story? And am I, you know, this idea of like oversharing our experiences at the, at a compromise for our child, you know, I, it's like, it, it's almost like you, there's a point where you feel guilty of sharing something too truthful, right? Because, well, they're likely going to learn how to read someday. And sort of like, it's like, you have to think about what your third step is going to be before you unload it, right? And I know that we're all thinking about those things, but that is such a burden and a weight. And that is one of those instances that I feel like can clog you up creatively, but if you can sit with it and if you can share in that and know that it's healthy and that it's okay, then maybe something more beautiful can grow in that space. And that's just where I'm, I'm 
hoping to be in for a little while. Um, and that can't happen without the community of other, other mothers sharing. So um, I'm grateful. And um, if anyone would like to contribute a mom monologue, I would be so pleased to share with it and add it to the collection. I was just gonna say that I, I think it's beautiful that you have taken on the heavy role of taking on these stories. Um, I just think it's special that people are trusting you with this and you trust yourself to hold that space for other moms and to then hold these stories because it's a, I mean, that story that made me tear up because I was like, oh, I miss my dad. <laughs> you know, oh, I would have loved my dad to be in the room, you know, so it's, it's, it's just a beautiful thing and, and um, to translate that into art. I mean, that's what this is all about. <laughs> I'm really thinking about how motherhood can change one's practice, you know, the studio practice, but also like a sense of purpose in life. I'm curious about how motherhood has changed your ideas about beauty, you know? Is that something anybody wants to comment on? Does that seem relevant? I can start. I am, um, so I figure model and I, with the figure modeling, I'm always like, oh, Vassar's getting older. Maybe he's gonna start feeling weird that somebody will be able to find an image of his mother online. And so we talk about it, but he's just like, well, you know, he's grown up going to the museum, seeing the human body, because that's what it is. It's just the human body. And so I, I mean, my body does not look like it looked when I was 20 my early 20s when I had him. Even now I'm almost 40 and my body is changing again. And, you know, he's very like, oh mom, I see your stretch marks. Oh, I did that to you. And I'm like, yeah, you did. Oh, you know, mom, oh, I see your C-section scar. I'm like, yep, it's there because that's, you are harvested from me. And so it's, it's like a playful banter, but I'm also like, oh, I'm glad that he knows like what a woman's body looks like, I think is so important. And I'm, I don't know, it makes me just feel okay with like, you know, this is what my body did. And, and so I, I love my body and it's strong. And I just wish that other, all moms could get that, you know, everybody has their moments, but we are who we are. And these bodies, this is what we did with them. I love how that question started out with um, beauty in mind and it ended with strength. Yeah. That's beautiful. I think about beauty um, a lot and how we present in the world and how we are judged and how we judge ourselves. I, it's really interesting raising two daughters that are very different and have different ideas of how important presenting beautifully is. Uh, one of my children, she's she wants to have fun and she doesn't want accessories to get in her way. The other one, it is accessories all day long. I hear her talking about beauty as it's pink, it's pretty, <laughs> it's sparkly, it's pretty. I mean, it is, it's a direct correlation. And she, and she already at a very young age asks, do I look cute? And, and I, you know, I, I, I think about femininity, which growing up in Alaska was not something I was ever comfortable with. I think about setting aside my fears for her and letting her love what she loves. And that, that becomes harder <laughs> because I want to shape, uh, my urge is to, is to you know, not get her the pink things, but I also wanna honor her um, complete joy in them and have femininity not be a negative. Um, and, I, and I feel that that, reflects in the artwork that I make where I have embraced pink as a color and, and find it very powerful. Um, and it, it, so it's directed the imagery and the colors that I use in that way. And I also working with, you know, my own body as a subject for painting is 
scary, but also really truthful. And I find um, like there, I had, I did a, a painting of a nude with a C-section scar and um, it's, it's something that maybe wouldn't, you wouldn't notice until you've had a C-section. And then every mom that sees it that's had one knows exactly what that is and, and can feel that. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, the imagery and the, the transcendence of painting as a medium for me really makes sense. Um, and, I, and I do think that I, I've always felt that beauty is kids, things that are grotesque or, or um, not typically considered beautiful are beautiful. Like that's, we had a, we had a course in college called beauty. <laughs> it was my, one of my favorite classes. Uh, so that's something that's very much on my mind all the time. But I do like thinking about how I view myself as a person. I find that the, the, the beauty in motherhood is it's in those experiences and it's in their delight in the world and in me as a, as a, a loving entity in their life. And I find myself much more accepting of my flaws than ever before. Um, Cause I wanna be that example for them that they don't have to, that perfect doesn't exist. And I wanna be, um, I, want, I, want, I wanna be one of the ways that they see beauty in the world. Cause they certainly are, you know, children are so beautiful. <laughs> Oh, I think you're on mute. So powerful. This conversation, I can't believe we've talked for an hour. I feel like really look forward to talking with you all more and to see the ways in which your dialogue unfolds and fruits into um, new new works, you know, collaborative. With, you know, or um, independent, however it unfolds. This is a very um, rich vein that you've opened up for all of us. So I just wanna thank you so much and invite um, you to continue this dialogue when you feel ready again with the questions that you have and the work that you wanna share. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asia. And it's really nice to talk with you all today and be here. Can't wait to do it again. All right, take care. Bye-bye.